uh, as you probably know, uh, what we're talking about here is as you registered is I'm talking about the end of the advertising world as we know it. This is something I have been thinking about for a while and something that I think has taken me uh, a few months to be able to articulate. And I hope I do a good job today. This is certainly, you know, the most, uh, my kind of biggest effort in articulating this, um, this transition and change that, that I have been uh, kind of tracking and we've been talking about. And we're gonna structure it in a few ways of just kind of talking about what the landscape is right now and how do we move forward. Um, but to, to kind of continue to set up, I think that what is happening right now is the most fundamental shift in the way that advertising works that we have seen, I would say since World War II. And maybe some of you are rolling your eyes at that uh, and don't believe me. Um, and I'm gonna try to explain why I think that is. And I don't think that, you know, we have seen the full implications of the things that are starting to change now. And I hope that as going through this presentation, uh, I hope everyone gets to learn a little bit. Um, and I hope that you can kind of come out of this, um, if you agree with me, with a better understanding about where I think things are going to be in the next couple of years and how you as marketers or influencers uh, can react today to kind of get ready for some of those changes. Um, so let's get into it. So let's, let's like do a little history lesson, if you will indulge me. Um, I love advertising. I've kind of, you know, I mean, been into it since I was younger and it's, it just fascinates me. And, and I think good to kind of set up how we got where we are today. As we think about advertising today, how did that come to be? Um, and after World War II, there was an unprecedented shift in consumer behavior. Uh, a lot of it around people moving out of the cities, right? Uh, until then, the vast majority of the population in America was held in cities. That's where the jobs were. If you weren't farming land, you weren't living outside of a city, right? Um, that makes sense. Um, there were no cars, uh, really. There was no easy way to get in from the city. Um, there was a number of reasons why that was, but after World War II, people came back and they just, they wanted to get out of the cities. Um, they started building suburbs and we started to see this big shift, right? Uh, the suburban population went from 19% to 30% uh, over that 20 years from 1940 to, to 1960. It was probably more like 1946 or seven to 1960 that most of that change happened. Doesn't seem like a, a huge number, but again, if you think about how population density and how much of the population of America is held in cities even today, moving 10% of the population um, out of cities into the suburbs had huge implications. How did they do this? Well, you know, uh, one thing was we had a lot more TVs. Um, you know, that didn't create the shift to. Uh, to, to the suburbs, but it is important. We'll skip and go back. So one big thing is car ownership, right? Uh, there was, you know, car ownership was growing in the uh, teens and twenties. And then you see it plateaus in uh, during the great depression falls uh, during world war II because of gas rationing, right when the war ends, absolute like spike in car ownership, right? This means now I can drive into the city. I don't have to live near a train. I don't have to live near my job anymore. I can commute in. Um, I can have more space. Again, I can get out of, of that city. Um, so people are buying cars uh, at a pretty crazy rate. They're moving out to the suburbs and they are buying televisions. I mean, this is pretty wild. If you look at this graph and think that from, you know, around 1952, where we had about 18% of households that had televisions, to 1958, six years later, we're at about 81%. Absolutely wild uh, how quick that adoption was of that new technology and, and how impactful it was, right? So uh, people have more cars, they are buying homes in different places. 
and life just looked a lot different, you know, in the 1920s pre-depression. Um, again, most Americans lived in cities and they walked to work and they shopped in their neighborhood. You know, they bought uh, food from the local grocer. They got clothes from the local clothier. They, um, they walked to work. They, you know, after work and they came home, they probably were spending time, you know, out on the streets, walking around, um, you know, the apartments of, you know, certainly even the middle class apartments. Um, if you live in New York, you know, they're not great. People weren't spending their time inside. Uh, they were in the city. And again, they were shopping local. They were working local. They were living there. Um, go to 1950. Now I am, you know, living in a house outside of the city. I wake up in the morning and maybe watch a little bit of TV, get ready for work. I get in my car. I'm listening to the radio. I get the train. I got my newspaper. I go to work. I come home, you know, have some dinner, watch some TV with the, you know, with the wife and kids, go to bed, do it all again, over and over and over again. Right. So it's pretty big shift in the way that people were living from 1920 to uh, the early 1950s. And that shift starts to create this, you know, what we'll call scaled media as we know it. Um, again, where before, um, you know, products, uh, companies were hyper localized, you know, you have the, you know, kind of in the uh, mass production engine ramping up. So we're not even touching that side of things, we're just touching the ad side of it. So, you know, one, there are more nationwide products, and now there is a nationwide apparatus um, to talk to customers, right? And so for the first time, brands have this ability to communicate with millions of people with the same message really, really easily. And that completely changes the game, right? And so now brands need to have these kind of cohesive messages. They need to have things that millions of people can see and will be compelling. And so to do that, they more and more, they need a really great ad creative to do it, right? And so now you've got, you know, any brand going to an ad agency and saying, hey, we need you to help us sell beer, you know, burgers, home products, beauty, whatever it is. Um, and, and that, you know, agency, what they need to do is, is obviously create messaging again, that is going to appeal to millions of people who will be either watching a certain television show, reading a certain newspaper, listening to a certain radio station, right? So they don't know a huge amount about the customers. Um, so these ads need to be pretty broad and they need to be compelling. Um, and, and like off to the races, thus starts kind of modern advertising as we know it, right? And, and it was really powerful for brands because at that time, the way you found out about a product was through an advertisement. Right, um, and this was the big shift with more ads happening and with more national brands. Brands were talking to you through ads, and there was enough kind of of this scaled media where they could tell you the story that they wanted you to hear. That that you know, Marlboro is a cigarette for rugged men with mustaches uh, who are also cowboys. So like kind of like me, right? Um, uh, I'm like the modern Marlboro mayor and it, it would appear I'm just as handsome as, as these guys, right? Um, and Coca-Cola could tell you that Coke was about, you know, America and it was about your family and, and it was about joy and, and all the things that, you know, you enjoyed in your life, uh, better enjoyed with a Coca-Cola, right? And and that was the message and that was the story that people heard over and over and over and over again, right? And, and advertising, you know, and all this content was so new, especially on television, it was so exciting. And, and you know, it exploded and brands could just, you know, they were growing at an unprecedented rate. Um, and the ability to tell these kind of compelling stories in your ads um, was a big competitive advantage. Um, and as we kind of then look forward to, you know, what happened throughout the, the next decades, you know, you got the 60s, uh, total control of the message. It was also pretty product focused, right? If you, if you kind of, um, you know, Marlboro and the Coke stuff was uh, a bit more uh, of a lifestyle play. 
Um, but a lot of, of the 1960s, 1970s advertising was about what does this product do and how is it better than other products? And then as we move into the 80s and 90s, really started to lean into celebrity endorsements, right? All of a sudden, you know, there were these celebrities that were that were larger than life, Michael Jordan, um, you know, however it might be, I, I'm not a sports guy, but you know, they were there and, uh, and they were hawking everything. Um, and then, you know, 2000, 2010, we have a few things happening. One, like, um, we have the dawn of social brands are, you know, again, leaning even more into storytelling, um, trying to become personalities, thinking of what their persona is going to be. Um, and advertising gets further and further away from the kind of 1960s. I'm going to talk about um, what this product does and is trying to kind of create these cultural moments um, into, you know, uh, recently, which we'll kind of talk about a little later in this, uh, in this presentation. So, Again, looking at it, if you look at this is one of Ogilvy's most famous ads at 19 at 60 miles an hour, the loudest thing in the new Rolls Royce comes, the loudest noise in, this, in the new Rolls Royce comes from the electric clock, right? That is a product message through and through. Um, it is saying, you know, this car is incredibly quiet, luxurious, all of that. Um, you know, imagine a ad with, um, you know, three solid columns of, of copy now, obviously that, that, I don't think that would happen. Um, again, then we move into uh, the celebrity age. Then we, then we kind of jump the shark, uh, you know, Grace, our strategy VP, I was showing her this earlier, who's from Australia. She's like, I don't know what this is. I was like, you don't know the like, what's up bud commercial. Um, I guess that did not make it to Australia, but, you know, I feel like these ads, the like was up ads, um, moved advertising into this place where again, it was about gimmicks. It was about, you know, what kind of, can we create a cultural moment? How can we do something ridiculous to catch people's attention that has literally absolutely nothing to do with the product. Um, but there was some magic that happened that like, even though it had absolutely nothing to do with the product, it was still going to increase sales. Um, and then, you know, 2010, again, really got into brand storytelling. That was when like every single brand had a magazine, it seemed like, right? Everyone was starting publications and they were doing, you know, short films. And, and you know, for a time, that was kind of what the it marketers were doing was, uh, was this brand storytelling. Um, um, and then three important things that kind of happened in the last 10 years uh, that are changing. Again, all of that, that last, what, uh, 70 years of advertising, I think have been changed by a few fundamental things in the last decade. Number one is that centralized scaled media is losing its power and reach. Uh, this is not a hugely alarming story for y'all. Uh, I'm sure you understand this. You know, print, print uh, magazines are way down. Um, this graph actually surprised me a little bit. Um, this is uh, TV viewing by demo, right? Um, so TV is essentially being propped up by uh, the 50 uh, plus crowd, um, but we're even starting to see the 55 plus uh, go down for the first time really uh, ever. Um, but younger demographics plunging, right? Uh, when you look at TV viewership. Um, you know, news traffic, traffic to news sites is uh, getting absolutely crushed. Um, I was stunned to see how bad the uh, viewership was at the Olympics this year. 15.6 million people watched the Olympics. That's uh, the lowest ever. Um, and, you know, even going back uh, a few, only a few Olympics to, you know, 2012, 2016, um, which were the last summer ones, uh, which are generally do better than winter, you know, it, just unbelievable hemorrhaging of attention here, right? And this is, this is crown jewel, right? Outside of, of the Super Bowl, um, the Olympics has to work for um, advertisers for NBC, uh, for people and you could tell you watched Olympic, right? There was an ad every three seconds um, and it was essentially unwatchable. Uh, it's because, you know, while they weren't getting as many views as they wanted to, they still had to 
get eyeballs on the ads. So they had to play the ads more and more. Uh, and it was uh, unwatchable and pretty terrible, honestly. Um, Super Bowl, you know, lowest number in 15 years. The Oscars, um, you know, 56% decrease from last year. That is astonishing. Uh, Emmys, Grammys did terribly. I saw that the MTV, you know, video awards had less than a million people watch them. It's just, just wild. Um, so that's not a huge surprise. Scaled media, right? That thing that allowed brands to tell one story over and over and over and over again and completely control the narrative. That is, that is gone. Okay. That's disappearing. Um, at the same time, consumers stopped caring and trusting um, these ads, right? After 70 years of being marketed to, I think a lot of people got fed up, right? Even with the celebrity endorsements. Ogilvy says that the viewers have a way of remembering the celebrity and forgetting the product. But also it started to be like, what is Michael Jordan doing, you know, hawking McDonald's? He's an athlete. Yeah, he doesn't like, there's no way, that guy shouldn't be eating McDonald's. He shouldn't be drinking Coca-Cola. Like that doesn't make any sense. Why do I care what cologne a celebrity wears? You know, like it just, we, we started, we, we were trying to, to have this like cult of personality and celebrity be able to carry advertising, but that wasn't working. And also, you know, again, like more and more stories, we, we hear more about brands and we're feeling like, oh, actually like a lot of these ads, because they moved away from like product benefits, they're just kind of, you know, lying to us, right? And, and, and brands start to lose control of that story. You know, this also happened because, uh, as scaled media started to collapse and as social grew, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but as that was happening, uh, it meant that there were more voices in, in the crowd, right? It was more than just what the brand was going to say that was gonna impact uh, what people understood to be true about a brand. So again, go to one of the great marketers in history, Coca-Cola, you know, and what do you hear about them now? You hear about how much plastic they create, right? How, how terrible polluters they are, right? They've, that wasn't a story 10 years ago, 20 years ago. If it was, it wasn't as pervasive as it is now. Um, and it's because, you know, while they have lost the ability to communicate with their customers through scaled media, their customers have gained the ability to say what they feel about the product and they feel about the company on social. And we see this over and over again, you know, McDonald's um, and, you know, all the backlash that they've had. Uh, and even something like, you know, Ellen, right, who, who built her career and saying, like, uh, I'm being kind. And then, you know, uh, essentially with one tweet uh, where someone says, you know, she's notoriously one of the meanest people alive and all of these stories come out, her career is over, you know, and it's because for decades, the people in power had the ability to control the narrative completely. And they did it because they owned media, right? And now, again, that media that they own, which they still do, not as powerful because not nearly as many people are watching it. At the same time, these new platforms come up uh, that are giving people power and they can say whatever they want. They can say, actually, I met this person, they weren't that nice. I think that Coke creates too much plastic, right? Um, so they lose control of that narrative. Um, another important thing, influencers, bloggers, creators emerged, and they have the two things that advertising is lacking and is searching for, trust and attention, right? I don't really need to tell a lot of you uh, on this, you know, on this chat here, uh, exactly kind of how powerful the, um, you know, this has been. Obviously, the the rise of these social platforms um, is uh, has been, you know, faster than uh, many imagined, and is is really only uh, getting started. Um, you know, there was Kim hosting SNL uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and kind of trolling them and saying, you know, that, you know, she usually has 360 million people watching her and SNL has like 10 million. So it's just like a chill night, you know, and uh, a great joke because it's, it's true, right? You, you start to like 
step back and you realize um, the shift has already happened, right? Like MTV music, Movie Awards having 860,000 people watching them, like it's the ship has sailed. Um, and on top of that, uh, again, these these influencers, they they have the trust of their audiences, a thing that advertising has lost, right? And so we start to see, you know, we start to see dollars flowing to them and we start to see, you know, this whole kind of ecosystem that has existed since after World War II for the first time is, is really blowing up. Because if you even look back at social, you know, and the rise of digital ads or the rise of social, um, it's still kind of, operated the same, right? That like brands still had the ability to control the narrative with money because, you know, it's all about eyeballs on a message. Um, they had the money to make sure that the vast majority of the people they wanted to interact with were hearing the story from them and they've lost that power, right? That, that media is, is being dismantled that's being decentralized and this is this is a trend that's happening throughout every industry this is what the internet does this is the beauty of the internet is that it takes power from you know the few and it starts to spread it out right and so if you think about you know in in movies uh you know you had to be in with one of the you know four or five movie studios they were deciding what movies got made. They were deciding which actors and actresses got to make those movies, which directors got to make those movies. Um, and, you know, while we might think, oh, some of that power has just shifted to the Netflixes, the HBOs, the, you know, Amazon Primes of the world, that is partially true. Um, but the breadth of what is being created now is so much broader because Netflix is reacting to you know, what, uh, you know, they're able to make things in these little niches. They're able to take chances. They're able to, you know, I mean, having something like Squid Games be the most popular show that they've ever done, no major network would ever have made that, right? And music, you know, music used to be, you had to get signed to one of the, you know, five big labels. They had the relationship with the, um, you know, with the radio stations and they just created stars, you know, they just picked them. They said, this person, this band, is going to, uh, you know, to be popular and, and like, we can just make that happen. Uh, and now, you know, with Spotify and TikTok and YouTube and everything that's happening, you know, the, the, the labels are on the back foot and obviously radio doesn't matter anymore. Now it's about, can you get a community around you, uh, listening to your music, sharing it, talking about you. And that is the path to, uh, to fame, you know, that's the path to being a successful artist. It's no longer getting the big record label because the record labels don't actually have a lot of power anymore um, because they don't need the radio stations. They need the community and the artists have the community uh, investing, you know, was only for the, the, you know, most wealthy. And, and obviously there's apps like Robinhood and even things like Bitcoin that are trying to come and shake that up and say that, you know, this should be something that everyone gets to do. We're going to decentralize this. We're going to take power away from the few and try and give it to the many. So I think it's important to look at what is happening in the influencer space in the broader context of decentralization, democratization, and and the kind of dismantling of the old guard that we have seen for the last, what, 20 years uh, in the internet. And they're just like going industry by industry, you know. Um, some happen earlier than others. Uh, music was obviously one of those first ones to be uh, disrupted, but, and, and maybe finance is, has been a bit slower, uh, but we're seeing it happen. Um, and it is part of that, that larger trend. Um, I think what's, so, as we look at it, and, and, and this was kind of the first slide that I, um, I made a few months ago as I was thinking about this and thinking about just how powerful this opportunity is for marketers. If we think about, you know, the way things used to go, let's say 20 million people are watching Monday Night Football and I'm a brand and I want to create an ad for that, right? I want to reach those 20 million people. So I go to the ad agency and, you know, we talk about how can I 
make a 30 second like short film essentially uh, that is going to uh, get these 20 million people who the only thing they have in common is they are watching football together on this one night. How can cre we create something that they're gonna remember um, and that's going to be persuasive? That is really hard to do. Um, and it is why brands spend, you know, tens of millions of dollars working with their creative agencies to come up with these pieces of content because, because the connections between the, the, the people that they are talking to are so loose, right? And so it has to be so widely, uh, widely entertaining, widely persuasive. Um, and so they, they create the ad, they put the media spend behind it, they run the ad in Monday Night Football, everybody's excited, you know, the boss gets a box at the game, everybody feels good. Uh, it works, it doesn't, who really knows, um, but that's kind of how things happen. Now, I think what's really exciting, let's take those same 20 million people and think about what we can do today, right? Now I'm brand and I've got a strategy of, of kind of what I want to achieve, you know, how I think, uh, you know, what is interesting about my product, um, how I want people talking about it. And instead of the one message, you know, the one message that we're going to package up and and interrupt someone's entertainment with to, to play in hopes that they find it interesting. Well, now we get to go to all of these different people, these circles down here. And again, uh, I wanna give my design team a break because this was my uh, illustration, not theirs. Um, so all these circles down here are, let's say, uh, influencers, right? And, and the size of the circle is, is representative of the size of their community. Right? And so now I can take this campaign strategy and I can go to, you know, 10 or 15 people who let's say we're working with big influencers, right? Let's say those, those 15, 20 people reach 20 million, the same amount as are watching the Monday night football game. And now the brand gets to go to the literal person who is, who is organizing that community, the person that built that community and is essentially running it and say, Hey, I'd love for you to talk about my new product, my brand to your community. And here's kind of how we're, you know, here's what we're wanting to touch. Here's the kind of main point. So love to hear how, how you can translate that and have that message resonate with the community that literally you have built, right? And then they, they the person who is respected, followed, trusted by that community. The people who are literally hit follow because they want that person in their life in some way. That person goes out to that audience and says, hey, this is what makes this brand so great. I'm so excited to be working on this, et cetera, et cetera. It is, you know, I mean, the opportunity here obviously is enormous, right? Nobody would think, playing a random ad that you had made to 20 million people or having, you know, a group of individuals who have built, who manage, who communicate with, who have a relationship with this audience, who is better to, you know, to persuade them, obviously the people who started that community, those influencers are, right? And, and this, you know, this shift from creatives to creators uh, is enormous. Right, it's it's huge because as a brand, you have to let go a little bit of uh, feeling like again, I get to control this story, right? Because because again, if we go back, you know, go back to the 1960s, 1970s, you found out about brands from ads. Well, but now you find out about brands from people, right? And so you don't get to say exactly what those pe people are going, right? Now on the paid work that you do, you get to direct it, you, you collaborate with them and certainly you have a brief, right? But, but there's also consumers, everybody has a platform, right? And so they're finding out about your brand from other people. You have lost control of the narrative and that's just gone, right? I think that like, if you walk away with anything as a marketer, like your ability to control your narrative, that is gone, right? And now it's about, directing it, about participating in it, about curating it. And we're going to talk a little bit about that now. It's a good segue. So how do we move forward? Um, so as brands lose control of their story, it's vital that you center it in honesty and authenticity, right? We saw 
uh, last summer brands being called out uh, a lot uh, by their consumers. And I'm not going to pontificate here in another, you know, uh, like soliloquy on, on cancel culture or any of that. I, I think that what is what happened last summer for a lot of brands was that they spent 10 years telling their consumers that we're friends, we're your friend, we're your buddy, right? Um, and look, we listen to the same music and, and we like the same things and, and you know, we're friends. And then the consumers said, okay, uh, if we're friends, like prove it, you know, do you support this thing I support? Cause that's really important to me. And then the brands would be like, oh yeah, no, we don't like, we don't do that, right? Or um, the image a brand was projecting, we learned that the reality was much different, right? It was just marketing. And, and that just was something a lot of brands, they just couldn't, they couldn't survive it. You know, when the story that you told was just that, was a story and wasn't rooted in honesty um, and you get called out on it, it, it's really hard to, to come back from that. And, and, you know, those individuals and those brands that, you know, have been really honest uh, about, you know, what they're doing and what, you know, what they believe in and, 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 you know, what their relationship with their customers are, they're doing, you know, they're having a much easier time having those conversations, right? Um, because they, they don't have, you know, as much uh, to hide. And I think that we are only again at the, the kind of beginning of that. And, and, and as marketers, um, you know, we, we have to root what we're doing in honesty because now that all of your customers have a platform, um, if, if you're putting out something that is not true, then you're gonna get called out on it. And getting called out um, is gonna be much more destructive than any good you think that this like really slick uh, lie you have uh, is going to do. Um, and again, as we said, right, this, this is, is kind of building, like, what does that future look like? The future is, it's not about your stories, but it's about the ones your, your customers tell. We talked about that, right? Like people are finding, about, finding out about brands from other people. And so your job is to, to help encourage those stories, curate them, uh, make sure there's more of them. Um, but over the next five or 10 years, your, your next 10,000 customers are probably not going to find out about your brand through your advertising. And, and again, that's a, that's a just fundamental shift. Um, but look, there, is, there are things we can do. This is kind of something we look at, um, right, it, it, as uh, just in the kind of influencer ambassador space, if you're thinking about this and you have your celebrities, your macro influencers, your paid partners, your gifting and affiliate partners and your customers, right? Now, again, total tide shift, different thing. Every single one of these people essentially has a platform, right? That fundamentally changes your relationship with your customers. When every one of them has a platform, it means you're gonna be more accountable to them, right? Um, but again, I think the, the biggest marketing opportunity in the world for any consumer brand is just getting their customers to talk about them more on social. Yeah. Cause I mean, like my mom who might be in this webinar right now, I mean, she's got, she's got thousands of TikTok followers, you know, she's on Instagram. It's not like it's a big following, but I think it is indicative of what is happening that like everyone is building a platform, big or small. And so how do you, one, use celebrities, macro paid partners to seed the story you want to tell? You, you can train an audience, right? We talk about this with influencers all the time, that you can train your audience. You can train them to, you know, if you're a fashion influencer, you can train them to like uh, expect beauty content from you, right? Brands, you can train your audience on how to talk about your brand, what stories you want them to tell, right? I think uh, Away did such a good job with this um, years ago when, when they were kind of 
uh, earlier on and they were doing a lot of gifting and, you know, they worked with influencers and, and um, everyone is posting those photos in front of the terminal with their bag, remember? You know, they probably like throw up the like peace sign or whatever. Um, and, you know, enough big influencers did that. And then that became the thing, right? You got in the way bag and then that's, you, you posted that, right? Um, and it became part of the purchasing and customer experience was posting that photo. They trained their audience to do that. That is hugely powerful. And there was no way they could have paid for all of the organic that they got, right? And that drove so much of that business. And it's about, again, being smart about using these, these partners at the top, the people you're paying to train that audience. And at the same time, using tools to listen to what the broader group is, is saying, uh, amplify the stories that you're seeing in there, um, you know, be able to catch things um, that aren't landing or are and pull those back up, right? And, and use those things to inform what your paid partners are doing. Um, so even though, again, the future of this is all about, uh, you know, what your customers are saying about you, it doesn't mean you're obsolete as marketers and it doesn't mean that there's nothing that you can do. Um, again, your role is in encouraging, you know, managing and curating these stories more effectively. Um, see, boom, that next slide, just what I said. Uh, so a few quick points here on uh, how we actually do this. How, how can we be successful in this, in this new world? Um, First and most important is do and make things that are worth talking about. Um, again, with scaled media becoming more scarce and more expensive, with the changes in iOS 14 and paid advertising and Facebook becoming less effective and more expensive, we're getting to this place where brands are going to have a harder and harder time buying their way into success, right? And fundamentally, this is no different than I think um, marketing, you know, the fundamental of marketing has been for years is that the product has to be good and interesting. Uh, and, you know, making things that people want to talk about, doing things in your marketing that uh, make people want to talk, you know, having some sort of positive impact in the world uh, and on your customers' lives is, uh, you know, should be absolutely central. Um, and that's really no different than it was years ago. But I think now, because it's harder to, you know, it's harder to put, you know, the money behind these stories to kind of get the story you want told out there and you need people to tell it, you need to inspire them to tell it, right? Because it's, again, it's going to be too expensive to pay everybody to talk about your brand. Um, we're happy to try. You know, if you want to give us that budget, we're very happy to try and, 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 uh, and tell the entire world about your brand through influencers, but that's going to be really expensive. And so you have to, you have to be doing things that get people excited. You also have to participate in the communities you're trying to impact. You know, here at, at four, a couple of months ago, I was a bit worried about um, how little like our staff was using TikTok personally. And so, you know, we, we created a challenge and we said, Hey, everybody, let's get on TikTok. We'll do uh, like 10 TikToks over the next couple of months. And, and it's been a lot of fun. And we've like, I, I think TikTok usage across the organization has, uh, has grown quite a bit, but it, it goes back to the point that like, if you're going to impact a community, you have to be first a participant in that community. Right. Um, because otherwise you're just coming into some, to a community and being like, hey, we're here. And, you know, we sell hot dogs and, you know, sit down and listen to, to what we have to say about hot dogs, right? Um, and increasingly these communities, especially on TikTok, uh, they will be like, get the fuck out of here. We don't want to hear about your hot dogs. <laughs> um, and so you, you have to, you have to participate. You have to do that to, to, you know, gain some authenticity to gain some, some recognition before you try and impact it, right? So participate before you look to impact it. Uh, don't lie. 
I think that, you know, uh, again, I, I feel like, um, I feel like this has been a trend the last 20 years that like advertising has uh, had to get more and more honest. Um, but again, I think that I, I'm, I'm very thankful that it's getting harder and harder for brands to just make up things or say, this is the story I want to tell and tell that story. Again, I, I, I think a great example is Coca-Cola, the, the, you know, some of the best marketers in the world. Um, and, you know, they're not really participating in, uh, in social in a huge way. And, and I think, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how they do because, um, you know, because I think that, that what the community is saying is that, that they're upset about how much they're polluting or, or that, you know, maybe uh, smashing six Cokes a day is not really that good for you. Um, and, you know, we have to be like honest about the things that our, our products do and, and, and how they impact people's lives. Um, and as that relates to, you know, executing an influencer strategy, uh, a few tips are first pick the right person. This sounds obvious. So I, you're like, James, why am I listening to this talk? Like, I know I have to pick the right person, but it goes beyond does this influencer like meet the needs of this campaign to is this person an embodiment of the brand feel, right? There, there is still that like the best brands still give you that like, that feeling, right? They, they like, you know, you can just like, you can just, you know, it's, a, it's, it's like almost a, a vibe, right? It's something, a je ne sais quoi. And, um, and finding that person that is a perfect embodiment of that is really, really hard. Uh, I think it's, it's, you know, what a lot of our clients pay us for and, and, and you know, what we do a great job of is, is putting that extra work in and understanding the space to be able to really pick somebody that is perfect. Uh, not someone that you want to work with, not someone that you followed for years and you'd be excited to work with them. All that is really fun. Um, but it's about picking the, the right, the perfect person. And, then that, and that's because, again, you know, these communities are more apt to call out a partnership that doesn't make sense, you know, and call bullshit on. It. And I remember reading Ogilvy's, um, you know, great book on advertising that he wrote whenever, 70s or something, 80s. And, uh, you know, he talks about how, you know, there are ads that can actually negatively impact sales. You can run an ad and by running that ad, it can actually harm your business. And that is absolutely true in the influencer space as well, right? That like, you can have a partnership that, that negatively impacts the business, right? Because you pick the wrong person who's not excited about it, whose audience doesn't make sense for it, whatever it might be. Um, but, you know, we talk a lot about like real love, right? And, and ambassador marketing and how, you know, when somebody posts, we, we want it to, we don't want it to just feel real. We want it to be real. When they say, I'm so excited to work with this brand, I should really be like, I know you're excited to work with them um, because you've talked about them a bunch or because, this is an absolutely perfect partnership for you, right? Um, and that's actually really hard to get. And, and if, if, if you're not you know, front loading that and spending a huge amount of time finding that perfect person, um, then I would encourage you to, to, to really spend more time there because again, it, it's not about just finding someone, it's about finding the right one. Um, Bring that person to the table creatively. Again, you have this opportunity to collaborate with somebody who literally built the community you're trying to, to access, right? I tell influencers sometimes that like, you know, ads, like brands are paying you. You're like a, you know, you're like a chic bridge troll, you know, and they're paying like a, a fee to get past you and get to your audience, right? It's not, it's not about the influencer. Like, um, yes, they need to craft that message and they need to deliver it. But like, we're getting to the audience. That's what we want. We want those eyeballs. And they are, you know, again, they're the, the chic, they're the, the bridge troll in Chanel, right? And, and so 
we want to bring those people to the table. They built that community. They DM with them every day. They understand it, right? And, and part of our job, or at least part of as we see our job, is to help coach that influencer and to give them, you know, uh, we talk about like giving them a fence when we brief them to play in. Um, so give them creative freedom, but also give them boundaries so they don't um, step into a place that, that isn't going to be helpful. Um, but if, if you aren't letting them help drive the creative around how am I going to get this audience to care about your product, um, then you're flushing your money down the toilet. Um, and be transparent about the partnership. Again, I think four or five years ago, the goal for a lot of brands was like, I don't want this to seem like a partnership. Can we hide it? Do we have to put, you know, do we have to put ad? Do we have to put sponsored? Um, obviously that's kind of past, but there's still this idea that like, well, maybe we can kind of hide that it's an ad or like success would be if nobody thought this was an ad. And that it partially is true, right? That like something should feel so natural that you, uh, you don't realize it's an ad. Um, but, uh, people aren't dumb. They know an ad, an ad's an ad. Uh, and increasingly, especially on TikTok, there's a huge amount of transparency around it, right? And it's gone kind of completely the other way where it's just like, boom, okay. You know, you even see this on influencer stories where they're just like ad break, right? Um, I don't know if I really like, that's a side note. I don't really know if I like the whole like ad break slide, but uh, I digress. Um, people are being more transparent, being more open that these are partnerships, right? And because of that, again, it needs to be better. It needs, you want that audience to, when that's posted and they're like super excited to be working with blank brand, that audience to be like, amazing. That's awesome. Congratulations. You know, and you'll see some of the like, especially on TikTok, like get that bag. Congratulations on, you know, on securing the bag. Uh, that's like young person speak for getting paid as, as I understand it. And our Gen Z people tell us, uh, but, um, but they're celebrating you know, they're celebrating those wins and they're celebrating the partnerships that make sense. And they are dragging <laughs> the ones that don't, right? And that's again, why uh, making sure, uh, you know, you have the right person, you have the right partner and you have, you have talked to that partner and you've gotten their feedback is so important when you're going to those communities. Have fun, okay? Like this should be fun. I, I think that if, you know, if you're not enjoying collaborating with your agency, with your coworkers, with the influencers that you're working with, if the influencers don't look like they're having fun, that is, you know, that's never going to work. You know, passion is, I think, the most compelling, persuasive thing in the world. You ever talk to somebody like at a, at a dinner party or something. And they're like, they're into something really weird that you're not into. Like they're talking about some, some niche thing they're into. Um, and like 10 minutes in, you're like, you're super invested and you're like, well, then what, what happened? What, what happened next? And what, how does that work? What happens there? Right. It's because passion is in infectious. People want to be around passionate people. Um, and they, they want that for themselves, right? Like people want to be engaged. They want to care about things. And, and for us, it's something we want and try and get out of all of our influencer partners, right? That we want to transfer excitement. You know, we want them to be excited and we want that excitement to transfer to that audience. But that's a really hard thing to fake especially if you're not an actor. Uh, and you know, you know when somebody doesn't want to do something, you know when they're not having fun. And I think it's, it's probably not talked about that often, but I would, I would just make sure you're having a good time. Uh, because again, we're, we're interrupting people's lives and trying to sell them something. Um, and the content should be fun and it should be, you know, a fun thing that we're doing. And if it's not, it's not going to work anyway. So we might as well not do it. Okay. Some kind of structural things here. And we're coming towards the end and then we can have a few questions. 
Um, <clears throat> it's just another quick like piece of advice. A few years ago, it felt like a brand would say like, here's my ad, here's what I'm doing. Um, and here's what I'm doing in TV, print and digital. And then they'd come to us uh, and say, uh, we've got this campaign launching in three weeks. Uh, can we get influencers to support it, right? And influencers were supporting this brand idea. Um, and it never really made a huge amount of sense. Um, and now, you know, what we're seeing more and more of is that we're starting with influencer, right? And, um, you know, have you seen those commercials? You saw some during the Super Bowl that literally look like Insta Instagram or, or, or TikTok, uh, like, ads, uh, like, you know, they're literally like faking uh, social content now. Um, but also like they're using that content more and more for, you know, for the digital stuff they're doing for print. Um, and again, even in TV. And I think that again, this, the old model of, I have a, a story, can I get influencers to tell it is, is done. You need to start with, um, you know, working with your influencer partners uh, to think about how to communicate this, because uh, again, what you're doing on, on TV or, or or general digital, I think, is not going to have as much impact as what's going on in the influencer space. Um, kind of wrap things up here. Uh, you know, for me, this is not about a new kind of advertising. This is not me saying like influencer marketing is the future. It's it's about that shift from brands for 70 years have been able to control their story and tell the story that they wanted told. And now they can't, right? And they have to collaborate with their audience and they have to collaborate with their customers. And that I, we haven't seen the full implications of what happens in that shift. Um, but I can almost guarantee it is, it is larger than most people think and advertising as we know it uh, is is kind of in its swan song um, and uh, and 10 years from now we'll look almost nothing as it looks today I think that's really exciting I think y'all are at the forefront of that and uh, you know here at four we're, we're very you know happy and honored to to partner um, and be there for you from a technology standpoint or or to work with our our amazing agency um, business to, to help brands navigate this new reality. Um, uh, let me see if I have any quick uh, questions. Where can we find a recording of the webinar? That's a good question. Uh, we'll probably have it. Tim, I'm assuming we'll have a recording up somewhere. We're also gonna send you in the next couple of hours, a kind of takeaway doc um, that's a, uh, a summary of this, uh, of this deck uh, with a couple kind of key takeaways and things like that. Um, what about platforms like Discord? I feel like they work differently from Facebook, Instagram. Um, yeah, I think that what we're going to see over the next 10 years as well is there's this idea that there can only be one platform, right? That it's a zero sum game. And I think that comes from the fact that like MySpace happened and then died and then Tumblr happened and then died. And so we keep waiting for like, Instagram's gonna die, uh, right? It's like, ooh, is TikTok gonna beat Instagram? But as people spend more and more and more and more and more of their time on the internet, on social networks, it's going to make sense that like, what is actually gonna happen is that 10 years from now, I think, uh, we'll still have Instagram and TikTok. I believe that. Um, but there's going to be all these little smaller communities as well, right? That like, it will make sense that, you know, more and more and more and more different types of little social networks pop up that, that meet a community specific needs. And so, you know, wherever your audience is, that's where you need to be, right? And if your audience is spending a lot of time on Discord, you have to figure out how to be effective on Discord. If they're spending time on YouTube, you need to figure out how to be effective there. Spending time on Twitter there, right? Um, so it's not gonna be a zero something. There's not gonna be one winner um, that kind of walks away with it all. And, you know, TikTok and, and Instagram aren't gonna have like a, you know, death match and only one will emerge while, you know, that would be uh, entertaining. I don't think that that's uh, going to be the path. But look, I 
crushed that on timing, uh, you know, content. Uh, hopefully we feel like uh, that was helpful for y'all. And uh, as always, I am here. Uh, the team is here um, for any questions that you might have, but I really appreciate uh, y'all taking the time to, uh, to spend an hour with us and, and uh, we hope to speak soon.